Section 5 of Volume 1 of A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume 1 of A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times by Francois Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 4. Gaul Conquered by Julius Caesar. Part 1. Historians, ancient and modern, have attributed to the Roman Senate, from the time of the establishment of the Roman province in Gaul, a long premeditated design of conquering Gaul altogether. Others have said that when Julius Caesar, in the year of Rome, 696, 58 B.C., got himself appointed proconsul in Gaul, his single aim was to form for himself there an army devoted to his person, of which he might avail himself to satisfy his ambition and make himself master of Rome. We should not be too ready to believe in these far-reaching and precise plans, conceived and settled so long beforehand, whether by a senate or a single man. Prevision and exact calculation do not count for so much in the lives of governments and of peoples. It is unexpected events, inevitable situations, the imperious necessities of successive epochs, which most often decide the conduct of the greatest powers and the most able politicians. It is after the fair, when the course of the facts and their consequences has received full development, that, amidst their tranquil meditations, Analysts and historians, in their learned way, attribute everything to systematic plans and personal calculations on the part of the chief actors. There is much less of combination than of momentary inspiration, derived from circumstances, in the resolutions and conduct of political chiefs, kings, senators, or great men. From the time that discord and corruption had turned the Roman Republic into a bloody and tyrannical anarchy, the Roman Senate no longer meditated grand designs, and its members were preoccupied only with the question of escaping or avenging proscriptions. When Caesar procured for himself the government for five years of the Gauls, the fact was that, not desiring to be a sanguinary dictator like Sulla, or a gala chieftain like Pompey, he went and sought abroad, for his own glory and fortune's sake, in a war of general Roman interest, the means and chances of success which were not furnished to him in Rome itself by the dogged and monotonous struggle of the factions. In spite of the victories of Marius and the destruction or dispersion of the Teutons and Cimbrians, the whole of Gaul remained seriously disturbed and threatened. At the northeast, in Belgica, some bands of other Teutons, who had begun to be called Germans, men of war, had passed over the left bank of the Rhine, and were settling or wandering there without definite purpose. In eastern and central Gaul, in the valleys of the Jura, Alvernia, on the banks of the Seine, the Allier and the Dube, the two great Gallic confederations, that of the Idoans and that of the Alvernians, were disputing the preponderance and making war upon one another, seeking the aid, respectively, of the Romans and of the Germans. At the foot of the Alps, the little nation of the Allobrogians, having fallen a prey to civil dissension, had given up its independence to Rome. Even in southern and western Gaul, the populations of Aquitania were rising, vexing the Roman province, and rendering necessary, on both sides of the Pyrenees, the intervention of Roman legions. Everywhere, floods of barbaric populations were pressing upon Gaul, were carrying disquietude even where they had not themselves yet penetrated, and causing presentiments of a general commotion. The danger burst before long upon particular places, and in connection with particular names which have remained historical. In the war with the confederation of the Idoans, that of the Avernians called to their aid the German Ariovistus, chieftain of a confederation of tribes which, under the name of Swabians, were roving over the right bank of the Rhine ready at any time to cross the river. Ariovistus, with 15,000 warriors at his back, was not slow in responding to the appeal. The Idoans were beaten, and Ariovistus settled amongst the Gauls, who had been thoughtless enough to appeal to him. 
numerous bands of Swavians came and rejoined him, and in two or three years after his victory he had about him, it was said, one hundred and twenty thousand warriors. He had apportioned to them a third of the territory of his Gallic allies, and he imperiously demanded another third to satisfy another twenty-five thousand of his old German comrades, who asked to share his booty and his new country. One of the foremost Idoans, Divitiacus by name, went and invoked the succor of the Roman people, the patrons of his confederation. He was admitted to the presence of the Senate, and invited to be seated, but he modestly declined, and standing, leaning upon his shield, he set forth the sufferings and claims of his country. He received kindly promises, which at first remained without fruit. He, however, remained at Rome, persistent in his solicitations, and carrying on intercourse with several Romans of consideration, notably with Cicero, who says of him, I knew Divitiacus the Idoan, who claimed proficiency in that natural science which the Greeks call physiology, and he predicted the future, either by augury or his own conjecture. The Roman Senate, with the indecision and indolence of all declining powers, hesitated to engage, for the Idoans' sake, in a war against the invaders of a corner of Gallic territory. At the same time that they gave a cordial welcome to Divitiacus, they entered into negotiations with Ariovistus himself. They gave him beautiful presents, the title of king, and even a friend. The only demand they made was that he should live peaceably in his new settlement, and not lend his support to the fresh invasions of which they were the symptoms in Gaul, and which were becoming too serious for resolutions not to be taken to repel them. A people of Gallic race, the Helvetians, who inhabited present Switzerland, where the old name still abides besides the modern, found themselves incessantly threatened, ravaged, and invaded by the German tribes which pressed upon their frontiers. After some years of perplexity and internal discord, the whole Helvetic nation decided upon abandoning its territory, and going to seek in Gaul, westward, it is said, on the borders of the ocean, a more tranquil settlement. But, informed of this design, the Roman Senate and Caesar, at that time consul, resolved to protect the Roman province and their Gallic allies, the Idoans, against this inundation of roaming neighbors. The Helvetians, nonetheless, persisted in their plan, and in the spring of the year Rome, 696, 58 B.C., they committed to the flames, in the country they were about to leave, twelve towns, four hundred villages, and all their houses, loaded their cars with provisions for three months, and agreed to meet at the southern point of the lake of Geneva. They found on their reunion, says Caesar, a total of 368,000 emigrants, some 92,000 men-at-arms. The Switzerland which they abandoned numbers now 2,500,000 inhabitants. But when the Helvetians would have entered Gaul, they found there Caesar, who, after having got himself appointed proconsul for five years, had arrived suddenly at Geneva, prepared to forbid their passage. They sent to him a deputation to ask leave, they said, merely to traverse the Roman province without causing the least damage. Caesar knew as well how to gain time as not to lose any. He was not ready, so he put off the Helvetians to a second conference. In the interval, he employed his legionaries, who could work as well as fight, in erecting upon the left bank of the Rhone a wall sixteen feet high and ten miles long, which rendered the passage of the river very difficult, and, on the return of the Helvetian envoys, he formally forbade them to pass by the road they had proposed to follow. They attempted to take another, and to cross not the Rhone, but the Sound, and march thence towards western Gaul. But whilst they were arranging for the execution of this movement, Caesar, who had up to that time only four legions at his disposal, returned to Italy, brought away five fresh legions, and arrived on the left bank of the Sound at the moment when the rear guard of the Helvetians was embarking to rejoin the main body which had already pitched its camp on the right bank. Caesar cut to pieces this rear guard, crossed the river in his turn with the legions, pursued the emigrants without relaxation, came into contact with them on several occasions, at one time attacking them or repelling their attacks, at another receiving and giving audience to their envoys without ever consenting to treat with them, 
and before the end of the year he had so completely beaten, decimated, and dispersed, and driven them back, that of the 368,000 Helvetians which had entered Gaul, but 110,000 escaped from the Romans, and were enabled by flight to regain their country. Idoans, Sequanians, or Avernians, all the Gauls interested in the struggle thus terminated, were eager to congratulate Caesar upon his victory. But if they were delivered from the invasion of the Helvetians, another scourge fell heavily upon them. Ariovistus and the Germans, who were settled upon their territory, oppressed them cruelly, and day by day fresh bands were continually coming to aggravate the evil and the danger. They abjured Caesar to protect them from these swarms of barbarians. In a few years, said they, all the Germans will have crossed the Rhine, and all the Gauls will be driven from Gaul, for the soil of Germany cannot compare with that of Gaul any more than the mode of life. If Caesar and the Roman people refused to aid us, there was nothing left for us but to abandon our lands, as the Helvetians would have done in their case, and go seek, afar from the Germans, another dwelling place. Caesar, touched by so prompt an appeal to the power of his name and fame, gave ear to the prayer of the Gauls. But he was for trying negotiation before war. He proposed to Ariovistus an interview, at which they a right treat in common of affairs of importance for both. Ariovistus replied that, if he wanted anything of Caesar, he would go in search of him. If Caesar had business with him, it was for Caesar to come. Caesar thereupon conveyed to him by messenger his express injunctions, not to summon any more from the borders of the Rhine fresh multitudes of men, and to cease from vexing the Aeduans and making war on them and their allies. Otherwise Caesar would not fail to avenge their wrongs. Ariovistus replied that he had conquered the Aeduans. The Roman people were in the habit of treating the vanquished after their own pleasure, and not the advice of another. He too himself had the same right. Caesar said that he would avenge the wrongs of the Aeduans, but no one had ever attacked him with impunity. If Caesar would like to try it, let him come. He would learn what could be done by the bravery of the Germans, who were as yet unbeaten, who were trained to arms, who for fourteen years had not slept beneath a roof. At the moment he received this answer, Caesar had just heard that fresh bands of Suavians were encamped on the right bank of the Rhine, ready to cross, and that Ariovistus, with all his forces, was making towards Wesontio, the chief town of the Sequanians. Caesar forthwith put himself in motion, occupied Wesontio, established there a strong garrison, and made his arrangements for issuing from it with his legions to go and anticipate the attack of Ariovistus. Then came to him word that no little disquietude was showing itself among the Roman troops, that many soldiers and even officers appeared anxious about the struggle with the Germans, their ferocity, the vast forests which must be traversed to reach them, the difficult roads, and the transport of provisions. There was an apprehension of broken courage, and perchance of numerous desertions. Caesar summoned a great council of war, to which he called the chief officers of his legions. He complained bitterly of their alarm, recalled to their memory their recent successes against the Helvetians, and scoffed at the rumors spread about the Germans, and at the doubts with which there was an attempt to inspire him about the fidelity and obedience of his troops. An army, said he, disobeys only the commander who leads them badly, and has no good fortune, or is found guilty of cupidity and, and malversation. My whole life shows my integrity, and the war against the Helvetians my good fortune. I shall order forthwith the departure I had intended to put off. I shall strike the camp the very next night, at the fourth watch. I wish to see as soon as possible whether honor and duty or fear prevail in your ranks. If there be any refusal to follow me, I shall march with only the tenth legion, of which I have no doubt that shall be my praetorian cohort. The cheers of the troops, officers and men, were the answer given to the reproaches and the hopes of their general. All hesitation passed away, and Caesar set out with his army. He fetched a considerable compass to spare them the passage of thick forests, and after a seven days' march, arrived at a short distance from the camp of Ariovistus. On learning that Caesar was already so near, 
the German sent to him a messenger with proposals for the interview, which was but lately demanded, and to which there was no longer any obstacle, since Caesar had himself arrived upon the spot. And the interview really took place, with mutual precautions for safety and warlike dignity. Caesar repeated all the demands he had made upon Ariovistus, who in his turn maintained his refusal, asking, What was wanted? Why had foot been set upon his lands? That part of Gaul was his province, just as the other was a Roman province. If Caesar did not retire and withdraw his troops, he should consider him no more a friend but an enemy. He knew that if he were to slay Caesar, he would recommend himself to many nobles and chiefs among the Roman people. He had learned as much from his own envoys. But if Caesar retired and left him, Ariovistus, in free possession of Gaul, he would pay liberally in return, and would wage on Caesar's behalf, without trouble or danger to him, any wars he might desire. During this interview, it is probable that Caesar smiled more than once at the boldness and shrewdness of the barbarian. Ultimately, some horsemen in the escort of Ariovistus began to caracal towards the Romans, and to hurl at them stones and darts. Caesar ordered his men to make no reprisals, and broke off the conference. The next day, Ariovistus proposed a renewal, but Caesar refused, having decided to bring the quarrel to an issue. Several days in succession he led out his legions from the camp, and offered battle, but Ariovistus remained within his lines. Caesar then took the resolution of assailing the German camp. In defiling in front of cars filled with their women, at his approach the Germans at length moved out from their entrenchments, and defiling in front of cars filled with their women, who implored them with tears not to deliver them into slavery of the Romans. The struggle was obstinate, and not without moments of anxiety and partial check for the Romans. But the genius of Caesar and strict discipline of the legions carried the day. The rout of the Germans was complete. They fled towards the Rhine, which was only a few leagues from the field of battle. Ariovistus himself was amongst the fugitives. He found a boat by the riverside and recrossed into Germany, where he died shortly afterwards. To the great grief of the Germans, says Caesar. The Swabian bands who were awaiting on the right bank the result of the struggle plunged back again within their own territory. And so the invasion of the Germans was stopped as the emigration of the Helvetians had been, and Caesar had only to conquer Gaul. It is uncertain whether he had from the beginning determined the whole plan, but so soon as he had set seriously to work, he felt all the difficulties. The expulsion of the Helvetian immigrants and of the German invaders left the Romans and Gauls alone, face to face, and from that moment the Romans were, in the eyes of the Gauls, foreigners, conquerors, oppressors. Their deeds aggravated day by day the feelings excited by the situation. They did not ravage the country, as the Germans had done. They did not appropriate such and such piece of land, but everywhere they assumed the mastery. They laid heavy burdens upon the population. They removed the rightful chieftains who were opposed to them, and forcibly placed or maintained in power those only who were subservient to them. Independently of the Roman Empire, Caesar established everywhere his own personal influence, by turns gentle or severe, caressing or threatening. He sought and created for himself partisans amongst the Gauls, as he had amongst his army, showing favor to those only whose devotion was assured to him. To national antipathy towards foreigners must be added the intrigues and personal rivalry of the conquered in their relations with the conqueror. Conspiracies were hatched. Insurrections soon broke out in nearly every part of Gaul, in the heart even of the peoples most subject to Roman dominion. Every movement of this kind was for Caesar a provocation, a temptation, almost an obligation to conquest. He accepted them and profited by them. With that promptitude in resolution, boldness and address in execution, and cool indifference as to the means employed, which were characteristics of his genius. After nine years, from 696 AUC to 705, and in eight successive campaigns, he carried his troops, his lieutenants, himself, and, ere long, war or negotiation, corruption, discord, or destruction in his path, amongst the different nations and confederations of Gaul, Celtic, Cimbric, Germanic, 
Iberian, or hybrid, northward and eastward in Belgica, between the Seine and the Rhine, westward in Amorica, on the borders of the ocean, southwestward in Aquitania, centerward amongst the peoples established between the Seine, the Loire, and the Saône. He was nearly always victorious, and then at one time he pushed his victory to the bitter end, and at another stopped at the right moment, that it might not be comprised. When he experienced reverses, he bore them without repining, and repaired them with inexhaustible ability and courage. More than once, to revive the sinking spirits of his men, he was rashly lavish of his person, and on one of those occasions, at the raising of the siege of Gergovia, he was all but taken by some Alvernian horsemen, and left his sword in their hands. It was found a while afterwards, when the war was over, in a temple in which the Gauls had hung it. Caesar's soldiers would have torn it down, and returned it to him, but, Let it be, said he, tis sanctified. In good or evil fortune, the hero of a triumph at Rome, or the prisoner in the hands of Mediterranean pirates, he was unrivaled in striking the imaginations of men, and growing great in their eyes. He did not confine himself to conquering and subjecting the Gauls in Gaul. His ideas were ever outstripping his deeds, and he knew how to make his power felt, even when he made no attempt to establish it. Twice he crossed the Rhine, to hurl back the Germans beyond their river, and to strike to the very hearts of their forests the terror of the Roman name. AUC 699-700 He equipped two fleets, made two descents on Great Britain, AUC 699 and 700, several times defeated the Britons and their principal chieftain, Caswallon, and set up across the channel the first landmarks of Roman conquest. He thus became more and more famous and terrible, both in Gaul, whence he sometimes departed for a moment to go and look after his political prospects in Italy, and in more distant lands where he was but an apparition. But the greatest minds were far from foreseeing all the consequences of their deeds, and all the perils proceeding from their successes. Caesar was by nature neither violent nor cruel, but he did not trouble himself about justice or humanity, and the success of his enterprises, no matter by what means or at what price, was his sole law of conduct. He could show, on occasion, moderation and mercy, but when he had to put down an obstinate resistance, or when a long and arduous effort had irritated him, he had no hesitation in employing atrocious severity and perfidious promises. During his first campaign in Belgica, AUC 697 and 57 BC, two peoples, the Nervians and the Aduaticans, had gallantly struggled with brief moments of success against the Roman legions. The Nervians were conquered and almost annihilated, their last remnants huddled for refuge in the midst of their morasses sent a deputation to Caesar to make submission, saying, Of six hundred senators, three only are left, and sixty thousand men that bore arms, scarce five hundred have escaped. Caesar treated them kindly, returned to them their lands, and warned their neighbors to do them no harm. The Aduaticans, on the contrary, defended themselves to the last extremity. Caesar, having slain four thousand, had all that remained sold by auction, and fifty-six thousand human beings, according to his own statement, passed as slaves into the hands of their purchasers. Some years later, another Belgian people, the Iburans, settled between the Meuse and the Rhine, rose and inflicted great losses upon the Roman legions. Caesar put them beyond the pale of military and human law, and had all the neighboring peoples and all the roving bands invited to come and pillage and destroy that accursed race promising to whoever would join in the work the friendship of the Roman people. A little later still, some insurgents in the center of Gaul had concentrated in a place in the southwest called Aurelic Dunum. Nowadays it is said Puy de Sola, in the department of the Lot, between Virac and Martel. After a long resistance, they were obliged to surrender, and Caesar had all the combatants' hands cut off, and sent them, thus mutilated, to live in Rome throughout Gaul, as a spectacle to all the country that was, or was to be, brought to submission. Nor were the rigors of administration less than those of warfare. Caesar wanted a great deal of money, not only to maintain satisfactorily his troops in Gaul, but to defray 
the enormous expenses he was at in Italy, for the purpose of enriching his partisans, or securing the favor of the Roman people. It was with the produce of imposts and plunder in Gaul that he undertook the reconstruction at Rome of the Basilica of the Forum, the site whereof, extending to the Temple of Liberty, was valued, it is said, at more than twenty-five million five hundred thousand francs. Cicero, who took the direction of the works, wrote to his friend Atticus, We shall make it the most glorious thing in the world. Cato was less satisfied. Three years previously, dispatches from Caesar had announced to the Senate his victories over the Belgian and German insurgents. The senators had voted a general thanksgiving, but, Thanksgiving, cried Cato, rather expiation. Pray the gods not to visit upon our armies the sin of a guilty general. Give up Caesar to the Germans, and let the foreigner know that Rome does not enjoin perjury, and rejects with horror the fruit thereof. End of chapter 4, part 1